Welcome to Spiritual Directions with Father Joseph Matlack and Father Joshua Voidis. Join them each week as they unpack the timeless wisdom of our forebears in the faith and show you how it points you toward a greater Christian life. Welcome to the Spiritual Directions podcast. Well, in my tradition, we've just finished celebrating the Feast of the Ascension of our Lord. And Father, correct me if I'm wrong, but in your particular area of the world, that feast has been moved uh, three days to Sunday. Is that right? To Sunday, it's done by, it's usually done by, well, it's always done by um, archdiocese, so province, you know, so in the uh, province of Atlanta, it's moved to Sunday. But in other provinces in the United States, in the Western Church, it was yesterday. Right, so you get to be with our Lord for three more days than than us. Exactly. So, well, happy feast, and you too. We're, we're already uh, counting down to the feast of the descent of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, and I think that you and I would celebrate that together, right? Yes, Fifty absolutely. days after Pascha. Yes. Okay. Now, since last week we spoke, we we devoted an episode to the topic of the emotions in the spiritual life, and since. Um, spiritual life, uh, you know, often involves the emotions and and sometimes um, so-called charismatic prayer or, or 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 the charisms in prayer, receiving the charisms, um, are, is often associated with the emotions. We thought that it would be a good segue into looking at um, how prayer is um, is charismatic. What does that mean? What does it look like? And how the fathers treated that. And maybe how contemporary Christians are doing it, whether it's the same, whether it's different, what are the benefits, what are the drawbacks of, of so-called you know, prayer to the Spirit, in the Spirit, and through the Spirit. And already there's a, there's a great distinction between our traditions because, I mean, you know, obviously there are similarities, but I think one of the things that people often point out as different between the Eastern and Western Christian traditions is that they'll often say to me, like, you know, you Easterners are very mystic or, or mystical or or mysterious. And they'll, they'll say things like traditional and conservative and, and established and set. And then they'll well, I mean, say, even, even you know, in, in kind of even modern English, the word Byzantine is very often taken to mean as a little bit complicated, a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit, you know, mysterious, a little bit, right. you know, kind of not normal or average or everyday or whatever. So even that's kind of crept into into the language a little bit. Right. And then people will contrast that with, say, contemporary Protestant worship or prayer and sometimes Catholic prayer, depending on which group you're at, as to say, well, it's a little bit less structured and so on. And we saw a couple of episodes ago that that's not always true. I mean, the liturgy is structured. Things like the rosary are structured. And I remember you even saying to me that that you like praying the Jesus prayer and you were saying how it's different from the rosary, for example, because in one sense, the Jesus prayer is less structured, whereas the rosary is more structured. So why do you think people have pitted our traditions against each other in that way? I think, well, I mean, I think they're really basing that on the the liturgy, the Eucharistic liturgy. So the mass, divine liturgy, or, you know, in whatever tradition it's called, or the Sunday liturgy, the principal Sunday liturgy. And mm -hmm. because for most Christians, especially the kind of Christians who are going to be making that kind of distinction, it's that's their primary interaction with their faith, even with other expressions of the faith, you know, because if you're going to see it like in a movie or on TV or something, that's what they're going to show you usually. And so that's very often I think that's just what they're familiar with. That's what they know. And so that's and so if you take kind of the well, you know, we have this, which is kind of not like that in terms of structure, you know, it, that's really not entering into the equation all that much, I think, usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just curious. Why do people um, identify, I don't know, um, prayer to the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit as somehow having to do with the emotions? Why do they do that? To, to answer your question, I don't know. In <laughs> fact, you know, and... and um in in our lectionary this week, you know, so the week leading up to to Ascension and then leading up to Pentecost, it's been a lot of, especially in the gospel, it's been a lot of the gospels where Jesus is saying, I will send you an advocate. I will. And I've been talking about this a lot because I think maybe, you know, I said I don't know, but I'll speculate a little bit. I think maybe it's because 
when we when we talk about the Trinity, God the Father is a very concrete kind of kind of idea, right? We know what a father is. God the Son, we know what a son is. That's a very concrete, and it's a very it's a very it's a very ana analogous on purpose, very deliberately to a human experience that we have, right? We have a human father. We know what human sons are. You and I are human sons. You know, the whole Holy Spirit though is a less concrete kind of idea. There's not really an analog to that in our everyday life. It's like, well, yeah, you know, there's God the Father, and then there's my Father, and then there's Father, but there's not like, well, here's the Holy Spirit, and there are all these other spirits I'm interacting with throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And so I think it becomes, and because spirit, especially today, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts, the idea of spirit it, very often, a lot of people think of it as kind of vague, a little bit loose, a little bit more pliable. And so I think as a result, because the emotions are very often a little bit vague, loose, pliable, they tend to associate that with the Holy Spirit. That's just a speculation of mine. But, you know, I think, you know, I, I think that makes sense. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that th that could kind of give a little bit of an explanation of kind of why that is. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's very interesting to to see that because, um, I mean, <clears throat> if you look at how the liturgical tradition approaches the Holy Spirit, it's obviously straight out of the scriptures as well as the fathers of the church. And what or who, I should say, is the Holy Spirit? Of course, we believe in the Trinity, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equally God, three persons in one God. And <clears throat> clearly the Holy Spirit it being the third person of the Trinity, is the divine person in and through whom we acknowledge Jesus as the Lord, as as the scripture teaches us. No one can say that Jesus is a Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So I don't know, when I when I think of the Holy Spirit, I you know, I, I don't think of the emotions. I think of the the the, the revelation. Okay, so it, it, even in the Byzantine tradition, in our liturgical tradition, um, I believe you have a, a feast of the the Holy Trinity. It's like a standalone feast. Is that right? It's it's um yes, yeah, it's, it's one of the Sundays after Pentecost. Right now, for us, the feast of the Holy Trinity is Pentecost mm -hmm. because it's the revelation of the. It's like it's completing the image of the Holy Trinity. So it's when the Holy Spirit comes down upon the uh, the, the Theotokos, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the and the apostles. Uh, finally, G God is revealed. The, the the full victory of God is revealed. And in our in our tradition, it's interesting because that means that you know Christmas, uh, the nativity of the Lord, leading to the passion, death, and resurrection, and the ascension. But that in that's not complete until Pentecost happens. So the Holy Spirit comes upon us and reveals to us the fullness of the Godhead and then sends us forth. So it equips us with what we need in order to minister to the kingdom in the world with our with our particular vocation, our, whatever we are called to do in the world. And it's just, for me as a, as a Byzantine Christian, as someone who lives this apostolic tradition, just the jump from that to a more um, emotion-based spirituality is it's just very unusual to me and to my tradition. Well, I, think it's, I don't think it's just unusual to your tradition. I think it's unusual to, it, again, if we look at history of Christianity as 2,000 years, which it is, right. I, think it's, I think it's unusual to the history of Christianity in general. One of the things, like I said, you know, we've been having readings about, you know, Jesus talking about sending the Holy Spirit the past several days. And one of the things in, in preaching that I've been kind of going on about, <laughs> you know, as, as we're kind of repeating myself a little bit, but I think it bears repeating, is that what Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to do is going to remind you of everything that I said. So kind of confirm everything that I said and is going to strengthen you to go out and proclaim what I've said. A lot of the times now in kind of contemporary Christianity what the Holy Spirit, you know, air quotes, the Holy Spirit does, because this isn't real, but the mm -hmm. thing that gets attributed to the Holy Spirit, I guess, is the Holy Spirit changes what Jesus says. The Holy Spirit brings the church up to date. The Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is, again, like we were talking about earlier, that kind of vague, kind of vague, amorphous kind of idea that does kind of correspond with the emotions, the desires, the passions in general, you know, that, you know, well, the Holy Spirit is kind of keeping the church up to date, but Jesus never says, 
you know, the Holy Spirit will come and remind you what I've said and update it as, as, as he sees fit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, that's not what Jesus says. It's the Holy Spirit, in a sense, doesn't make more vague. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit solidifies and strengthens, you know, the belief in our understanding of the deposit of faith. It deepens our understanding and our, and our knowledge, but doesn't change, doesn't alter, doesn't make more vague or more obscure. Yeah. Have you ever heard the phrase when, you know, when people will say, well, I feel like the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me da, 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 whatever. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> what does that mean? Is it really the Holy Spirit or is it maybe my own thinking, whether good or bad? You well, know? I, 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 I hesitate to say one or the other, because I think, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, if we look at the lives of the saints and the fathers and, and, and beyond, Obviously, the Holy Spirit does move people. It does mm -hmm. move. The Holy Spirit moves people to all kinds of things to go, you know, because we constantly hear about that, you know, to go preach somewhere, to go mm -hmm. preach to this person, you know, to go suffer martyrdom somewhere, you know. But also, I, and, and so we're encouraged then to test, you know, to test the Spirit, to, to make sure, because I think I don't want to say that that's not the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to say it all the time is either. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I think the main thing you have to look at is the Holy Spirit is moving me to do what? Is it something holy? Is it something in line with your vocation? You know, the Holy Spirit is not going to, you know, you know move you to abandon your wife and children to go, you know, do something. Like, that's not what the Holy Spirit... A monastery yeah, or yeah. The Holy Spirit's not going to do something that's counter to morality, that's counter to your vocation, that's going to be harmful to you or, you know, in, in terms of the salvation of your soul, you know, I mean, the Holy Spirit might, you know, lead you to martyrdom, which is harmful to your body, you know, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, not, not saying that it's harmful to your salvation, the salvation of others. And so I think what happens is certainly the Holy Spirit moves in people. Certainly the Holy Spirit guides people. But I do think there is a tendency, especially now, to kind of, quote, blame the Holy Spirit for kind of everything that I'm doing, everything that I want to do, every kind of thing I feel. You know, because I've heard people say the Holy Spirit is moving me to do this, and it's some, like, very mundane thing. You know, right. that, you know the Holy Spirit is moving me to go to this restaurant for dinner. I'm like, I don't I don't think so. <laughs> yes. you know, I don't, I don't Maybe know. we should, you know, pray a novena to know which restaurant nine days from now we'll we'll eat at. Yeah, I mean, it, it's. <laughs> I, I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, I think. Like I said, I don't want to say it's not the Holy Spirit, but I, you know, I, I would, like I say, test it. Right. Be careful. So, so how? What? What is the the scriptural and the patristic way, uh, the ancient way of testing the spirit? How do we do that? I think, I mean, I think the principal way, and, and, and if you're thinking of additional kind of further detail, you know, f add on, but, you know, m to my mind, it is, it is what I said already. It is, is this in line with what Jesus said? Is this in line with what the church teaches? Is this in line with the living out of my vocation? Is this, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, is this, or is this contradictory in some way? Is is it is the Holy Spirit moving me to some brand new understanding of Christian morality? Because if it is, it's not the Holy Spirit, right. probably. You know, the um, yeah, it, it's it's. I think is you know, am I is is what I'm being guided to kind of noble? Is it in line with all of these things? Right. A, a few episodes ago, you mentioned how everything has to be based on the truth. And so revelation is already given. I, I like what you said. So, well, and, and the Holy Spirit you know, is described by Jesus as the spirit of truth. Right, <laughs> right. Even in our tradition, you know, you, know, you have your, your prayer to the Holy Spirit, your classic prayer. We have, th th this is our classic prayer. It's a heavenly king, advocate, spirit of truth, uh, who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of blessings and bestower of life. So if we look at each of those elements, right, so the Holy Spirit is... <clears throat> well, the advocate, sometimes you hear the, the translation, the comforter, okay, so advocate or comforter, someone who advocates for us, uh, tells us what to say. I mean, Jesus in the gospel does say, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Spirit will speak through you um, because he's the Spirit of truth. So he was the one who, who empowers us to bear witness to the truth. And uh, he's everywhere present and fill, fills all things, of course. So he's now poured out into the world. He's the one who is the treasury of blessings. He's the one who blesses us and he bestows life upon us. And that takes us all the way back to Genesis, right? The spirit was there from the beginning. So it's not like, <clears throat> you know, because the spirit is God, <laughs> he wasn't conjured into being 
after Jesus ascended. No, he always was. In fact, he was the one who gave life to the the mother of God, uh, in in whom God became a man, became incarnate, and took flesh. So, so the Spirit is is there at the beginning, was there at the middle, and is there at the end. Yeah, we have, we have in the Creed who spoke yeah. through the prophets. You know, right? You know, exactly so. right. So when when I think about how the ancients, you know, approached prayer, and how it's very different from the modern time. And it's kind of like what you said last week. Prayer is not necessarily emotionless because you can have emotions and they can be good as long as they're channeled well. But how do we know, what do the fathers teach us and the and the spiritual masters, the saints throughout the ages, um, how do they teach us when, you know, it's it's veering off into dangerous spiritual waters i mean what are some of the what are some of the main pieces of advice they would give us i mean i i I would say and 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 i think we run into this several times i remember in the desert fathers a number of times in particular you know especially with something and this is standard also spiritual advice i think of to our own day that if it is something that seems a little bit extreme you know you know dangerous spiritual waters or just kind of you know well beyond is to to go to the church in in, yeah. in in a very real sense, your spiritual father, your spiritual director, and say like, I feel like I'm being called to this. Yes, let's talk about that. Let's make sure again, kind of like kind of the the standards that I that I mentioned earlier. Let's make sure it hits all of those. Let's make sure we're not doing something because the thing is, it's like I say, what well, it, ha- it has to be in line with the truth. It has to be in line with what Jesus says. It has to be in line with the vocation. I'm not for myself. I'm not always the best judge of that, you know, because I can be, you know, you know, this is going to sound a little Star Wars-y, I guess, but I can be clouded by emotions, you know, <laughs> you, know you know, you know, like, like, you know, my, you know, I can like feel very strongly a certain way. So in, in, and we very, we're very good at, do, at doing this as humans where I feel very strongly about this. So I can put aside like, well, this doesn't quite line up with the truth, but I can kind of like put that aside. It, this doesn't really seem to quite line up with my vocation, but I can justify it away. Yeah. We need that's why we have, you know, spiritual fathers, spiritual directors that we can go to who can look at it and, you know, and, and it has to be somebody, you know, to take that role, somebody who is well versed in things like that, but who can look at it and say, like, you know, no, this is, you know, who could say to me, like, no, you're a parish priest. This is where you're assigned. You can't go do that. That would be yes. in conflict with that, or that would take you too much away from that vocation, or that would be harmful to your parish or harmful to your people. Who could tell me that? So it's not just me justifying away. Everything. Right. Or, or you're a, a father or mother with small children and you can't pray the entire monastic divine office. Yeah. And you can't you can't come to like my <clears throat> chapel and do six hours of adoration every day and leave your child at home. You know, right. you know even, yes. it, but you might be feeling called to that, but it might be just because you feel like you need more prayer or something. But you, again, that needs to be directed. That needs to be channeled. That needs to kind of be molded through the church. So what I'm hearing is uh, humility. Um, and that's exactly what, you know, the Desert Fathers and the saints talk about. They talk Talk about humility, and humility is is so misunderstood. It doesn't mean putting yourself down. It means that you conform yourself to the truth of things, and that means if you do something good, then you humble you, to admit that is an act of humility. Yeah. So it's it's well, I think, I think to the Fulton truth. Sheen. I think even <clears throat> Fulton Sheen said, you know, mm-hmm. if I if I Fulton Sheen, you know, give a give a talk and somebody says, comes up to me afterwards and says, that was a very good talk. And he says, oh, no, no, it wasn't. He said that would be pride. You know, that yeah. would be a form of pride. You know, he, he would say like, you know, I have to ultimately give the credit to God, you know, for, for those gifts. But, you know, you, you have to kind of, like you say, admit when you did something good, admit when you did something wrong and admit that you are not the measure of all truth. Yes. <laughs> Let me be a bit provocative here. Some of the saints, both in the Eastern and the Western Christian tradition, talk about um, one should not, uh, how do I want to put this, unduly or irrationally seek the charismatic gifts. Um, Why do they say that? Isn't it a good thing to ask for charismatic gifts? Well, I'm going to base my response on on what you, the way you phrased it, unduly seek, you know, Mm -hmm. to ask for them, even to desire them, I think is fine. I, I don't think, but I think to unduly seek them what that can do is that can, you know, cause we talked about how, you know, the, those charismatic gifts, they can be, 
you know, kind of stirred up, you know, just like in, in the emotions as well, or kind of, kind of not, I don't want to say mockeries of them, but kind of imitations of them can be stirred up by the emotions. We can start to feel that the Holy Spirit's calling me to do this, that, or the other thing, which the Holy Spirit isn't really doing. So um, I think to say that their gifts, the way I've put this to people, because people have asked me this before, you know, why isn't God giving me this? Why isn't God doing this for me? I said, well, they're gifts from God. Mm -hmm. And if you need them, he knows and he will give them to you. Yes. You know, to 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 seek them undo. I mean, to like to just desire them and say, you know, like, you know, it would certainly be I would certainly appreciate it, though, and everything. But I from God. But I think the idea is if we're seeking the gifts unduly, then we're not seeking God. Yeah. Because the gifts are not God. They're a means to an end. The gifts are a means to an end, and they're a means to union with God. Seek union with God, and if those gifts would be beneficial, God will give them to yes, you. Yes, exactly, yes. I remember reading, uh, <clears throat> two saints come to mind. I remember reading one saying, be careful of even desiring God. And I was totally shocked when I first <laughs> heard that. But I think what he meant was, Sometimes when we desire God, we desire the image of God that we think he is, that we've created, right. as opposed to the real God. So allow God to reveal himself to you as he actually is and not as you want him to be. Right. That's the first one. The other one I heard, and this, this I think this is a recent Eastern Christian saint, but he actually said, and again, this, this shocked me when I read it. He said, um, <clears throat> don't pray for yourself. Uh, he said, when you make intercession, he said, pray for other people. And then what he would do is he would end the prayer with, and Lord, don't forget about me. <laughs> and I think what he was saying is that, and I think both of these saints were saying the same thing, that prayer has to be so humble that you're not asking for things for yourself. You're always focused outward in, in charity towards the kingdom, towards the church, and towards other people. And then God will not, well, not naturally, supernaturally, right? Or, or whatever, right? Yeah. It, <laughs> it, according to God's nature. According yes. to God's <laughs> nature, right. Yeah. Well, God will equip you with whatever you need to do that thing. Yeah. And I, I think it's I think it's similar. I was talking to a, a young person the other day who, uh, a very young person, I think, I think like third or fourth grade. And the, person, and, and the person asked me, if I pray for the souls of those who have died, that they'll go to heaven more quickly or, or however, however it was phrased, will that get me to heaven more quickly too? And I said, well, if heaven is union with God and God is love, any loving act that you do gets you closer to God, even if you're not specifically praying for that. So if you're praying for someone else, if you're praying for those who have died, if you're praying for, you know, people that are who are still living as a loving act, as a loving act of self-sacrifice, it draws you nearer to God. And, and kind of like you were saying, God will give you the gifts that you need then to, to fulfill that and to draw closer to him. And so it's the, the whole idea is that, you know, that we're conforming ourselves to divine love. We're conforming ourselves to him. We're meant to become like him, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, which means to imitate God himself. And so anything that we're doing to imitate God any, any, in any sense that we're striving for that, like you say, God will give us the ability, the gifts to do it. And we shouldn't worry about which of those gifts, which of those graces, which of those we want or we feel like we need. God right. knows what we need. Just let him do it. There's a, there's a really wonderful story from the Desert Fathers. Right. Uh, <laughs> as an Abba Lot went to see, Father Lot, in other words, went to see a, a Father Joseph and said to him, uh, Abba, uh, as far as I can, I say my office, I fast a little, I pray, I meditate, I live in peace, and as far as I can, I purify my thoughts. What else am I to do? And, <laughs> of course, Abba Lot, in typical Desert Father fashion, uh, responds, um, or Father Joseph responds, he stands up, stretched his hands towards heaven, and his fingers became like ten lamps of fire. And he said to him, if you will, you can become all flame. What on earth? <laughs> Does that mean? See, 
Okay, so I think this is the first we've read from the Desert Fathers in the podcast, and I think you can see why I love them so much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I mean, what, what a beautiful answer to a question. And, and it, it actually kind of reminds me of, um, of our Lord, who, who was... Who never, who very rarely answered questions directly, but answered them better than a direct answer would have been, revealing so much more. Yes, you know, and and you know, and, and it takes a little, it takes a little work, it takes a little, little bit of a burden uh, on yourself to, I think, interpret the Desert Fathers. And one of the things I like about them too, especially in something like what you just read, it's, you know, I think probably. If if you're asking me now what my understanding of what that means is, I hope in a year I would have a deeper understanding of it. In 10 years, I would have a deeper understanding of it still. But I think the idea is, at least in my, kind of that, my first, first impression of it, because I've actually not heard that one before. Mm -hmm. um, but my first impression of it is that he's answering, he's answering saying what you're doing. What you're doing is drawing you to God. You yeah. know, you know, what you're doing is is putting you in contact and what you're doing is giving you the ability to become fire, you know, filled yeah. with the fire of the Holy Spirit, you know, to become in union with God. And it's like, don't what else are you looking for? Right. You know, what I, yeah. else are you looking for? You are you, you yes. all the things you describe are putting you in union with God, in the presence of God. What else do you need? You know, do you need something more exciting, something more more fulfilling? There's nothing more exciting. There's nothing more fulfilling. You know, and and it's it's and I think a lot of people, especially as they kind of get involved in their faith, I think a lot of people they're looking for that kind of exciting moment or that powerful moment. It's like, you no, know, say your office, cultivate peace. Guard yes. your thoughts, you know, fast a little, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. That's I, what we're called to do. I think that that's the crux of this entire episode and the entire spiritual tradition. So if you listen to these, right, we're, we're done, we're done. <laughs> I think, I think the meaning is, as you said, right? So we, we forget that God is found in the so-called mundane and so-called repetitive actions of, of, our, of our Christian life and of our living, and we forget that God is actually there. And I think that's why we seek after the emotional thrills, yeah. because we think that, wow, you know, I mean, I, the, I mean I, you know, I've been a chaplain to many young people for many, many years, well, you know. A few years, yeah. okay, many years, <laughs> a few to many, but hopefully we're both young enough that we've not done anything for many, many years. All oh, right, I hope so, <laughs> yes. But what I've noticed is so many of them will say to me, "I just don't feel God is listening to my prayers because I just don't feel Him," and 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 that's the you know the entire spiritual tradition will say that um, God is not only. Just because you you don't feel God doesn't mean He's not there. Well, in fact, I was yeah. talking to somebody the other day. And who was saying, you know, kind of kind of lamenting a little bit, you know, not quite as badly as the word lamenting makes it sounds. But, you know, I pray and I cultivate kind of that stillness and everything, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not getting these gifts and was kind of like upset. Other people get them and I don't. And I said, I think if you ask the spiritual fathers, the spiritual masters of the church, they would say to not feel that is the greater gift, is the superior gift, because you're in the presence, because now you're seeking God. Now you're in the presence of God. The gifts, the kind of emotional gifts, the, um, you know, I, I, I forget what you'd kind of call them, like the kind of consolations in prayer or whatever. Yeah. Very often, I, I would say that's a, that's a very kind of beginning sort of thing. Because when those go away, what are you left with? Yes. You're left with God. Right. You know, it's God there, you know, and you're not there looking for the consolation. You're not there looking for the, 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 you know, you're, you're there just looking for God. It's a purification. It's a beautiful purification. And I told this person, I said, you know, I said, the gift you're receiving is great. Right. You know, because you're receiving what you're actually looking for. The, the emotional response. And like we've said before, like we said last episode, the emotions aren't bad. They are given to us by God. However, that's not the point of all of it. Yes, we, we're they the emotions, all of these other things are a means to an end, and the end is union with God. Right. You know, and if we start looking at them as an end in themselves, we start chasing after this high that we can never sustain, and it's ultimately going to bring our faith crashing down. There's another uh, wonderful, more contemporary story about Saint Seraphim of Sarov that I, I hope we can do an episode on one day because it basically, it, it completes what we've just said today. 
And so as you prepare yourself to celebrate the, the Feast of Pentecost, um, I wish you, uh, I wish all the Holy Spirit, I wish the, the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit with his fruits to come down upon you so that you might experience true life and communion with God. May God bless you and please join us again.